Remember, we want your questions for rapid fire. Shoot us an email at viewermail at autolinedetroit.tv or give us a call, 1 620 288 6546. You can get the podcast at the iTunes store tomorrow. It's free. Just look for AutoLine After Hours. We'll get going in a minute. I did. You did already? Yep. So I did a little blog on what the what the alleged GM Peugeot Citroen deal yeah. would mean. Good. And well, here, here's three or four Francophiles who want to see the cars come here and say, oh, I hope they bring some Peugeots or Citrons. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll talk about that. We should yeah. talk about that. Cause yeah. Anyway, I'm sorry, you're going to say something. No, I was going to say that's one of the things I had written down here. Uh, yeah. And then I did a whole thing this week on what Mazda's got to do because they're in deep trouble, too. Yeah, yeah. Then I thought we could talk about the, the Republicans bashing the bailout, you know, saying mm -hmm. they'd be better off mm -hmm. without it. And uh, Kyle Bush, you know, these are just things I've written down. You know, we can take this anywhere. And then I wanted to talk a bit about this car. Yeah. What was your second one? Uh, what Mazda must Oh, do. Mazda, right, yeah. We're about to run the billboard. Yep, go ahead. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone. Your journey, our passion. And by Chevrolet. Chevy runs deep. And especially... Mr. DeLorenzo. John, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. I, I am too. It's, uh, it's been an interesting week. It's been a good week. And we got Todd Lassa, too, from Motor Trend. Motor Trend Classics as well. Both of them. John, great to be here. Yeah, great having you. So what's the big news for you this week, Peter? Well, I mean, the Peugeot thing's pretty interesting. Because GM and Peugeot GM and talking Peugeot about getting because together. Peugeot, as we've known for a while, is in desperate financial straits that could implode at any minute. I, I think a big tip was when they pulled a plug on their championship Le Mans team, like overnight. Right. And, uh, you know. And, and maybe even having a good shot at winning this year. <clears throat> and I knew from that, because I was involved behind the scenes on, they were shopping that team. Um, so I knew, and, and I think GM must view this as a chance to soften the financial blow of, of what's going on with the Opal and grabbing something while it's hot. But boy, I think it's full of uh, issues. Boy, is it least. ever. To I, say the least. You know, you put two losers together <laughs> because Ooh. GM of Europe is a big loser. Or I should say Opal's a big loser right now. But it has to be, a, you know, it has to be a supply part or platform alliance, that sort of thing, which, exactly. which PSA is big into already. I mean, they develop diesel engines with Ford in the late 90s, the, the diesels that have been in uh, Jaguars and Land Rovers for a while. Yeah, but GM developed all those diesels with Fiat. Well, yeah. That was very expensive, by the very way, but they got some good they, diesel engines well, they got out of some it. some good diesel out of it, but they don't have the kind of lineup that you see, say, at VW or even BMW or Mercedes in terms of diesels. And, um, you know, it, it could be... But what's I'm, Peugeot got? Has it got that big of a lineup? Uh, I mean, I know they got good four cylinders, but yeah. is it any more than that? They they just they 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 do the four cylinder both gas and diesel with BMW on the Mini of course, mm -hmm. and uh, you know they have they've they've got some um, platform sharing. Um, you know Peugeot needs Peugeot Citroen needs a uh, probably needs a new small crossover platform which GM probably could uh, supply and then GM would get the factories out of them factories that are not in Germany by the way. And that's what's important there. Uh, the, uh, the the mid-size Citron and Peugeot crossovers now are the the one shared with Mitsubishi. That's getting old. Um, they're building those in Russia, 
and it's time to replace those. And Mitsubishi, and we're going to talk about Mazda pretty soon. Um, I, I did a piece uh, for Motor Trend, uh, I can't remember, last month or this month, on all the smaller Japanese com companies, the one, the, the independents and what their future holds. And, and so, you know, that could be a platform replacement for the Mitsubishi, I think. Well, you know, I think the, the big overriding issue is every time we hear about these corporate, you know, blendings, it all comes down to how soon can they make substantive changes bring the cultures together, you know, focus on platforms, and turn... Years, you're talking years. <coughs> there's, yeah. there's not enough time. And one thing Peugeot Citroen did not do, that Ford did, was, uh, of course, as we now know from years ago, the, uh, the um, what, what does Malali call it, the, uh, the home equity loan. You know, Peugeot, if you look at their ownership structure, it's very much like Ford's. They've got 30%. Right. Uh, the yeah, they own 30% of the stock, but the 30% the of the stock is worth like 46% of the vote. So it's not that different from the, uh, the Ford special family. Ford family stock. And uh, they're going to do everything they can to hold on to that, just like the Ford family did over the last six or seven years. Uh, unfortunately, uh, time's running out much more quickly for them. But I, I don't get this GM Peugeot tie up. I mean, you're going to share platforms? Really? I mean, doesn't GM happen to be the biggest car company in the world? So where does it get more synergies well, working with Peugeot? Again, they, get, they, they may be the ones, and we don't know yet, but they may be the ones supplying the pot platforms. Meanwhile, they get some cheaper labor, uh, low labor cost factories out outside of TSA, of which has a lot. <laughs> Not a lot, but they've got a few factories in Central and Eastern Europe. Yeah, but GM doesn't need more capacity in Europe. They need cheaper capacity yeah. than they need. Well, they do, but, you know, you still <clears throat> have got those German workers that I'm told, if you wanted to just sever those guys and tell them, no, nope, we're shutting it down, I I've heard a number that it's like $220,000 per employee to walk away from the deal. So it'd be... You're talking billions to walk away. Yeah, it would have been like uh, you know trying to get out of it before the, uh, the the bankruptcy, trying to get out of some of the UAW uh, deals. Back right. So unless you can shut down thing. those factories like Bochum in Germany and get yeah. rid of all those workers and transfer it to Eastern Europe where it's cheaper, where's the savings? I mean, I, I still don't see where this is going to work for GM. Mm -hmm. I don't either. And, and again, culturally, we've seen it time and time again. They don't. You can't just flip a switch and have everything work. Look what happened when the Germans came to Auburn Hills. Right. You know, it just didn't. In fact, that's true. I, Again, think I can <clears throat> name on on two fingers the the joint ventures or you know the the mergings of companies that have worked. And I would say Nissan, Renault. I don't. I, no, unquestionably, that's worked. I why and I, I give Gowen a lot of credit for this. He didn't try to jam the companies together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, they figured out ways where they can share stuff, keep them totally separate, separate cultures. And I would say when Chrysler got American Motors, although all it essentially did was keep Jeep and throw the rest right. in the wastebasket. <laughs> right. But I can't think of any other off the top of my head. I mean, Ford and Mazda, that didn't work. Ford and all its other things, GM and all its other things. I mean, Ford and Mazda is such a, I mean, that, that was Ford controlling Mazda. It wasn't any kind of, uh, I, you know, the, the scale of Mazda to Ford was much different than even the scale of Daimler to Chrysler. I would um, like to see on a fully accounted basis, I mean, all in everything, and maybe Malali had them do this, did Ford ever make a dime off its relationship with Mazda? Did it ever make a dime <coughs> off it? And that was on for what, 30 years or something like that? That's true, but they certainly, uh, you know, they, they certainly took advantage of the platforms uh, on the current, on the outgoing. Yeah, they shared platforms and yada, blah, 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 and but they had right. a plant, but I mean, did you make money? At the end of the day, when you, when you fully account for everything that went in, did they ever make a dime they off said that? They said they picked up Mazda after Henry the Deuce said he would never buy a Japanese car company when he was offered the Honda. chance to buy Honda. <laughs> right. I did a thing uh, this week, too, on what Mazda's got to do, because it's a, it's a puzzling company to me. It's a cool company. I don't know anybody who hates Mazda. I don't know anybody who's ever said, Ugh, you know, Ugh, I'll never buy a Mazda. Maybe there's somebody out there. I've never met them. Their cars are cool. I mean, they steer well. They, uh, they handle well. They brake well. Uh, I don't quite like the styling right now, but here's the problem. They make 13 different models, and they sell 1.3 million vehicles worldwide. 
So that averages out to 100,000 per vehicle. And none of them in the premium segment. None of them in that. None of them's a, a clear smash hit, runaway, big volume car. And they make them in something like 13 plants worldwide, that's too. The, that's the killer right there. That's the killer. Yeah. Yep. Now, I'll have to say four of those 13 plants are little CKD operations in Africa and South America. So it's not like that's killing them. But uh, it's just like the big three. They have too many models, too many plants. My RX, as it were, you know, my uh, prescription for Mazda is become the Alfa Romeo of Japan. Go for killer styling. You already got the bones. The structure of the yeah. car is great. You don't have to worry about that become the Alfa Romeo. Except that Alfa Romeo is part of Fiat, and that's what Mazda needs, it needs a partner. Even though it didn't work out with Ford very well, it ne uh, Ford at least it held it up for a while. And um, Who are they gonna get? Well, well here's the thing. They should have gone with Peugeot. <laughs> Peugeot and Mazda make a lot more sense to me than GM and Mazda. Well, they, they probably do. And, and again, um, remember, I mean, we're, we're not talking about, as far as we can tell, any kind of uh, financial hookup in terms of sharing stock or whatever between GM and PSA. That, that's, that's the supposition because GM and PSA aren't talking. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we, we expect to hear at the Geneva Auto Show, uh, expect some sort of announcement, but I don't expect any kind of uh, financial hookup between the two companies. Um, yeah, not trading stuff. Mazda needs, Mazda needs a partner that would take a share of Mazda. And uh, as you know, Ford had more than what it was, 35 percent or something like that, and you need 33 percent of a Japanese company to control it. Control it. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing about the Japanese companies in this this story that I did uh, for the Trend section of Motor Trend recently. All the independents. You basically you've had all the independents go away elsewhere. I mean, you talked about AMC, that being the last of the independents, and we. Those of us who remember that far back could talk about what do you Kaiser mean independence Fraser. because of AMC? Kaiser Fraser, everybody from the Kaiser Fraser guys. to Nash becoming AMC to Packard and so on and so forth. And he had some of those go away in Europe as well. The Brits, for example, either went away or became part of a larger concern, uh, except for a few uh, notable premium brands that have been uh, let go from Ford, for example. But uh, is it now Japan's turn? I mean, because Japan, the Japanese auto industry, has been its own singular thing for the last uh, 30 or 40 years. And we've seen Japan, the Japanese auto industry, peak. Face it. It's, it so now it has to go to being, uh, at best, a three-company country, just the way the rest of the world is. Yeah. And that would be you know, Toyota, Nissan, and, and Honda. And, and even there, you know, the, you know, Honda's got some bumps in the road up ahead. So, yeah, what, what becomes to not only Mazda, but also Mitsubishi? Um, Subaru is in much better shape. They're selling about 220, 30,000 cars a year in the States. They're doing fairly well here. Those companies are still also very... But remember, Subaru's the now, uh, Toy Toyota's taken an equity there position. There you go, exactly. They're sharing platforms right Being on... Being able the, to do the BRZ uh, and, the, 86, and, and the, right. the, the 86, the Scion FRS, whatever they're calling it, right. the rear drive car. Yeah, exactly. You get that out of that. That, that happened obviously when GM let go its twenty percent of, right. of uh, Subaru. So yeah, they, uh, Mazda even, needs a part. I even wonder about Subaru long term because they do about seven hundred thousand cars yeah. worldwide, far less than what Mazda does. And they're very niche, and they've got a great following. And as, right. as long as they can keep that going, right. I think they're going to be. As long as they can keep that going, along with Toyota owning a certain portion of them, they're okay. Mm -hmm. um, but Toyota is the great benefactor in in, uh, in Japan, and you know maybe uh, you know Toyota worries about becoming the the next General Motors, and it did that. It worried about that when it became the number one automaker in the world, and uh, you could almost see a scenario where it picks up uh, a few few percent of some of these smaller Japanese companies, including Mazda and does become the General Motors of Japan. It could happen, folks, I don't know. Uh, but those, those other companies need to, find, um, need to find partners. Mitsubishi, Suzuki, I don't know, you know. Turn well, you know, hourglass. Suzuki actually is, they're excellent at small cars, mm -hmm. and we don't see a whole lot of them in this market, but they're, you know, like number one in India, which yeah, yeah. isn't a whole lot of, to, to claim right now, but that's a growing market. India is a hugely growing market, and, but here's the other thing, you now have companies like Ford paying more attention to India. You've got Tata, while it, it's not had any, any success with its Nano, 
Uh, it still has, it, it's still looking to expand. It, it owns Jaguar and Land Rover now. Um, you've got a lot of other attention on India and, um, and Suzuki. Suzuki does well in other places of the world. find so, a lot of competition there because yeah. a lot of, because everybody's looking at India as being the next China. Right, but the, all the point I was making is that Suzuki does well in markets outside of North America. Mm -hmm. And so they, they might do, uh, they might be able to chug on for a while too. But yeah, if you buy what Marchioni is saying is that, you know, if you don't have six million, if you're a mass market company, if you don't sell six million or more units a year, you're, you're toast. Yeah. And, uh, I think he's pretty much right on that. I guess yeah. he better get going. Yeah, they. Yeah, he 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 got to pull up the Fiat side of the business. He ain't there yet. Right. Yeah. yeah. We take a break now. No, not yet. What do you make of these Republicans bashing? You know, uh, Rick Santorum, Mitt Romney come to Michigan for the Michigan primary, home of the auto industry, and say, "Oh no, GM and Chrysler, they they should all just let them die." It's just a, you know, I don't know, boneheaded campaigning of the first degree. I mean, you know, it's clear at the time there were no other alternative issues. I mean, there was no financing available. They couldn't have done it any other way. Nobody was, a lot of people weren't happy about it, but it had to be that way. So well, that's for, where I think they're stupid in yeah, what for they're them saying to, because... You couldn't get the money. And they're saying, oh, yeah, they could have gotten the money. Yeah. Well, and then Romney says that he was in favor of the bank bailouts, but not the auto bailouts. So, yeah, I mean, I guess you'd take bailout money from the <laughs> banks, uh, which would be the only way you might have gotten de uh, debtor in possession financing for the automakers back then. But the banks weren't about to do that. So, you know, every time I hear him say, well, they, they followed my advice and went into this kind of managed bankruptcy. Well, yeah, because the government basically gave them no other choice uh, to get these bailouts. And uh, frankly, I, I can't, I doubt we'd see the kind of change that we've seen at General Motors, especially if if GM had been left on its own to go through that sort of bankruptcy. Well, you know, two it, things. It would have taken too long. Sure. Look it at Delphi. It took long. Delphi over three years. Yeah. Uh, you know, Vistion, you know, the suppliers who went through, quote unquote, normal bankruptcies, Boy, they came out the other end, you know, a sliver of what they were before. And as much as GM still probably needs to change its culture and still needs to cut some fat, it would have been much heavier than it is now uh, had it been left to its own devices. So basically right. these two candidates are just, you know, boneheads and they should shut up. They should. Because it, it's just... Just, you know, to me, the proof that you couldn't get the money is look how we all say, oh, it wasn't Ford, you know, genius to go out and borrow the money when it still could. <laughs> that just proves it right there. Ford got the money while you still could and Chrysler and GM could not. Not that only that, but end. let's not forget, too, by the way, uh, this kind of gets glossed over now that Chrysler has decided, no, it's not going to take that. Uh, the, the loan for um, the, the government money available for uh, converting to uh, high fuel efficiency um, uh, plants, cars. Um, the only one of the Detroit three who has taken that money is Ford. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, it got a little bit of government assistance in a different way. It's, uh, you know, I, it, I, I would love for the free market to work the way it's supposed to uh, and, and for, uh, you know, let the winner win, winners win and the losers lose, but um, we wouldn't be sitting here right now. <laughs> We wouldn't. <laughs> You're right. That's so true. Hey, jumping topics. You wrote about Kyle Bush, uh, Bush this week. Uh, well, before okay. I talk about Kyle Bush, there's right. an ad that Toyota's running with Akio Toyota driving one of their stock cars. It's a completely nonsensical waste of money. <laughs> You got to see it. Well, is it bad or is it fun? It's not fun. It's well, just like Akio bad. pops out of the car and, and that voiceover says, Akio Toyota, the president of Toyota. I was, what? <laughs> you know, what? He, he, he got to go drive one of the stock cars and they filmed it and turned it into an ad. I mean, it's hilarious. <laughs> well, is it so bad that it's good? I mean, should well, I look for it or not? It's not even campy bad. Um, it's just like, well, why'd you do that? Right. I mean, the enthusiasts watching, yeah, we know Akio's in the cars, and that's cool. He drives, and that's cool. But to the general audience that sees this on the telecast Sunday, it's just like... All I can say is anytime I see a CEO of a company in an ad for his company... It doesn't go well. It's like this is... How lame can you get? The only the guy who bought Red Bull. The only guy who pulled it off was Lee Iacocca. Yeah, that's yeah. right. The only guy. The only one, right. Yeah. But every time I see whether it's this 
bonehead for Sprint or whatever, you know, the telephone. Anytime I see a CEO in an ad, I don't care if it's a TV ad, a print ad, or whatever, I just think, oh, how It's late. not really embarrassing. It's just, why'd you do it? Right. I mean, I don't get it. It's just, <laughs> and then they show the cars, the stock car team is... Uh, oh, Peter, weird. you know why they did it. Yeah, I know. It's, it's just like... Yeah. Huge ego. It's suck like, up oh, to the... Course. No, it's a suck up to the CEO. Well, yeah, let's get Aki over because our, our Toyota NASCAR program needs to be refunded, so let's, you know, let's run them around a short track in the car and let them be all happy and pay for the ad right. and it's all good. Yeah, I wrote a column about uh, after the Budweiser shootout, I, you know, I don't know if, you know, people bristle at NASCAR, people get the wrong idea about me. I don't have a problem with the drivers or the talented people who work on these cars because they're some of the smartest people in the racing business in the NASCAR garage right now. You have aerodynamicists, computer guy, you got some of the smartest people. And you, Even fuel injection engineers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you talk to Formula One guys and you know, there's a lot, of, there's surprisingly some cross pollination there that people aren't aware of. They have Is a lot right? of respect for each other. Really? Yeah. I mean, they do those uh, trade off drives every <clears throat> now and then between a NASCAR driver right, and an right, F1 right. driver. Trading pain. But yeah. you know, so when I, I've been critical of NASCAR management and their marketing. I have utmost respect for the people who work on the cars and especially the drivers because, you know, like it or not, that's where all the talent goes in this country because that's where the money is. Would I prefer a bunch of more talent in IndyCar racing? Would I prefer my favorite race is the Indy 500? I would like to see a, the, the rest of the series live up to that with huge crowds, but that's not, that's not what's going on. NASCAR, even on a not so upward trajectory is still the biggest thing in town. And I just, you know, I've been going to races since I'm 10 years old. I've, I've seen all the greats, you name it. And John, you've seen them. And I've seen, seen a lot of them. And I've yeah. seen them live. And, I've, and I think this kid, Kyle Busch, is the best, clearly the best American driver of this generation. And in a long time, I think he could get in anything and go fast. I know a lot of, some journalists were saying after the shootout where he just basically, to me, a great driver can grab a car by the scruff of the neck and will it to the front almost kind of weirdly in, in a mystic way. And, you know, all the greats did it. You know, Gurney, Foyt, AJ, uh, Senna, you know, all those. Mario. Yeah. Mario. And, and boy, in the old days, you used to see uh, like Jim Clark coming over here and driving everything. Right. You'd, you'd love to see that again from someone like Well, yeah. Kyle. I know. You know, I right. heard from, from uh, I got some hate mail saying, oh, well, Kyle doesn't, you know, he doesn't even hold a can, all those guys. I said, well, this is a different time now. Right. And, uh, but do I think Kyle could get in anything and win? Absolutely. I think he's head and shoulders the most talented American driver right now, the best right now. I would have loved to have seen him in Formula One. I think it's too late, he's 26? Well, he's 26, he'll be 27, I believe, in May. Uh, he could still do it, but you know, it's too bad. In the old days, there was all kinds of back and forth. Right. You'd had Grand Prix drivers at Indy, you had Grand Prix drivers in Can-Am. Right. And you know, and in Le Mans, and, and and yeah, Mario would go over and do guest drives for right. Lotus or Ferrari or, or Ferrari or whatever. Sports cars, yeah. stock cars, Formula One cars, Can-Am cars, now, Indy cars. Now, NASCAR, one thing I think NASCAR absolutely should do is cut their schedule by twenty-five mm -hmm. percent. If they did that, Kyle could do some guest drives. I don't have any doubt in my mind that he could do several intensive Formula One test sessions. And now he supposedly. Toyota was going to let them let him drive their car when they were still in F1. Did any? I never heard anything about it. I don't know if yeah. he ever got in the car. Or, I don't recall or if it went bad or what. Yeah, I don't recall if that happened. But uh, you know, I know Kurt Busch drove one of Penske's Indy cars at Sebring and did tremendously well. No kidding. Yeah. So um, I just think Kyle is a you know. And I, He's the real deal. Yeah, and He's I wrote the Oscar com. Guy. I was just trying, you know, all those racing enthusiasts that read my fumes com. I said, you know, appreciate what's going on right now. You know, it's, uh, you know, I love looking back and talking about the, all the great drivers, but right now, appreciate this kid's talent. Speaking of Toyota, we got to talk about the car in the studio yeah. with us this week because I, I've been test driving this Toyota 
Prius V, V for, for wagon, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> because this is kind of a station wagon-like vehicle. And uh, I gotta tell you, I don't like it. I, I, I'm, I'm really surprised because I've liked the Prius overall. I, I, I think it's, it's a breakthrough product, not just for Toyota, but for the industry. You know, first real mass market hybrid and it's selling like gangbusters, and now they're trying to expand the line. You know, they've got this wagon here that I've been driving. But, uh, you know, somebody said to me the other day, did all those Chevette buyers go out and buy <laughs> Priuses? Because they're all in the right-hand lane. They're all going like 50 miles an hour on the highway. And now I've discovered why. Because if you drive this car fast, I, I'm not even saying fast. Fast is the wrong word. If you drive this car and just try to keep up with traffic, it's not a pleasant car to drive. Mm. The engines almost always, you know, pegged to the laboring. Laboring. Uh, it's buzzy when it's laboring. It makes more noise than speed. And that's why these people are putzing around, you know, driving real slow, holding up everybody behind them because it's a very dissatisfying car to drive if you go over that. You know, since the since the uh, last Prius, the one that uh, everybody paid attention to, the 2004 model uh, came out. Uh, in, in the interim, all a lot of other compacts and midsize cars have upped their game in terms of refinement, in terms of ride quality, in terms of uh, uh, four-cylinder engines with a lot more power density and nicer interiors. And you you get to Wait, you know, the 2004 Prius was Motor Trend's car of the year that year. Uh, the next one that came out didn't, I don't think it even made the first cut. Hmm. And um, not that we thought it was a bad car, but it just didn't go anywhere. And, and part of it is that they didn't refine it. They Maybe they put more money into developing a you know, better range and better fuel economy and so on, but it didn't, but but all the money went into that and didn't go into the, the driver experience, if you will. What, what's the regular Prius cost? What's a base price, Todd? Do you know Gosh, off the top yeah, of I'm, your I'm head? I'm thinking it's still in the twenty five, six, seven thousand dollars I was going to say 24, 25, 20, yeah. guess what this thing costs? Uh, I know it starts around 29, doesn't it? And it just under 30, there. call it yeah. 30, because that's what it really is. Yeah. So this is just sort of a station wagon sort of-ish version, yeah. right? That's yeah. a lot of money to be this disappointed. This sucker's 36,000 bucks. Wow. Oh, no, no, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> is that a uh, pleather interior or what? It is a pleather interior, okay. right. What, what else do you get for the extra? You, you get a you get a backup camera and you got a screen and you get uh, automatic climate control. In fact, let me show you some of the things that I, I can't believe about this car, because uh, and uh, Chip's got the camera here. First off, we pull this thing in the studio. I don't know if you can see down here because it's leaking coolant. Mm. I mean, what the hell is this about? It's cold outside. It's not like it should be overheating or anything. We got a a puddle of coolant on the floor. And there's another thing that I don't like about this interior, the way that uh, the HVAC works. Let's see if I can show you this here, but you know, you can have the defroster come on, or you can have heat come out the dash in your face, or you can have it on your feet. Pick one, I mean, there's no combination. And if you go and turn on the the, uh, the heat coming out the, the dash, usually the air conditioning turns on automatically, I, which I don't really like. And it just sort of toggles back and forth between things on its own. There's no fan switch. You just adjust the temperature and the fan goes up or down automatically. I don't like that. I, I, I like controlling it. I, Todd, am I crazy or? No, you're not at all crazy. I think one of two things is going on, or maybe both things are going on. One, cost cutting, clearly. You know, we've got to put the money into the hybrid uh, technology. And two, you know, uh, you, you've been to a lot of uh, automaker previews where everybody talks about Apple being the idea eel. They don't talk about other car companies doing the best kind of cars, but we all want to be the Apple of cars. And, uh, you know, maybe they're trying to uh, reduce or eliminate as many buttons as possible and, and give you thing, not give you things that it has decided you don't need, even though you still want them. Well, I think it's aimed at drivers who don't like driving or cars. Yeah. Well, it's a that shame. Must be. Yeah, I'll tell you another thing. I'm not getting very good fuel economy in this thing. It, it's it's rated at 44 miles to the gallon in the city, 40 on the highway. 
Now, usually when I get hybrids, I, I really try to pull out all my hyper miling tricks and see how good a fuel economy I can get out of it. This time I decided, no, I'm just gonna keep up with traffic. I'm, I'm not gonna be a lead foot, but I'm just gonna keep up with traffic. I'm getting 36 miles to the gallon. Wow. And to me, and there maybe are it's, any number of new four-cylinder non-hybrid cars these days that get that that can get deliver that. Mileage. Right. Our Detroit office, we just in, in the Detroit office, we just took possession of a um, long-term VW Passat TDI six-speed manual, and uh, you know, 40, and you're all in love with 40, it. <laughs> well, 44 MPG on the highway, city mileage obviously is quite and a bit decent lower, power. But, Decent power. So when you put exactly. your foot into it, it's not you know yeah. all buzzy and laboring or anything like that. Exactly. But uh, so it, most of that mileage, would you say you're more highway or city mileage driving it around so far? I would, the urban cycle, right? Uh, I, I would give it. A, I'd say call it 50-50. Mm -hmm. 50 highway, 50 you know not highway. It's funny. I'm driving this. Uh, 2013 Chevy Malibu Eco, uh, which I give up tomorrow. I've been driving it for the week and. Uh, and it's that uh, e-assist, that mild hybrid right, system, right. and uh, you you have to be conscious. To it seems like you you need to kind of jam your the brake at, at stoplights to get the stop start to work, which is fine. Mm -hmm. But it's just something that uh, you, you change your driving style for uh, immediately because you're trying to get the best uh, fuel mileage out of it. Right. But, you know, that's what you do. Mm. Hey, we've got to bring uh, our guest on. Uh, we've got Rob Nichols, a supervisor at the Wixom Performance Build Center, where they build the coolest engines in GM and some of the coolest engines yeah, in the, the world. Business, yeah. Rob, why don't you come on up here? Let's get a microphone on you. And, and we're going to take a break. We're going to give a, a shout out to our friends at Bridgestone. Hey, we'll get to uh, Rob in just a second here. Those of you who are watching this show as opposed to just listening, those who are watching will see that we've got some different furniture on the set bit more casual, kind of comfortable look to it. And we've got that thanks to a company called Office Furniture Solutions, who are the ones who are providing the new after hours set. Especially we want to thank our buddy, Nate Anderson, for arranging all this. And uh, if you like what you see here, be sure to browse over to their website at ofsonline.com, or just pick up the phone and give Nate a call. You can reach Nate at 248-668-0077. And uh, we like these new digs. Yeah, I sure oh, certainly do. Yeah. Comfortable. Okay, but Rob Nichols, we got you here sitting with us. Uh, so, so good to have you on After Hours with good us. Good to be here. So they call it the Wixom Performance Build Center. I, I, I call it GM's Horsepower Factory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what it is over there. It's a... Uh, a haven for gearheads such as myself and millions of others out there. How many people uh, work there? Rob? We've got 16 hourly and seven salary right now. So small facility, we're building about 24 engines a day right now. So you do Really? <coughs> if only that, that many people, 24 a day. So you do all the hand builds of the super stuff, the ZR1? Yep, we build uh, LS7 engines for the Z06, uh, LS9 engines for the, the Superstar, the ZR1. And uh, LS3 uh, dry sump engines for the manual Corvette Grand Sport Coupe. And uh, don't you do the V-Series ones? We used to do an LC3, uh, what we called the LC3. It was a supercharged North Star engine. Uh, that's, that's went away several years ago. That was in the XLRV and the STSV. No other V-Series Cadillac. Did you do the ZL1, the ZL1 Camaro? Uh, no, not currently. No. So he's strictly Corvette. Strictly Corvette dry sumps right now. Uh huh. All hand built. All hand built by uh, skilled engine assemblers, who have usually right around 30 years of experience. Most of them with GM. That's so do, do you also do the uh, race engines for Pratt and for the Corvette racing? No, we racing? do not do those. Okay. Is it Wixom where uh, you uh, allow customers to come and build their own? Engine? That is uh, what we do at our plant. Uh, started about a year and a half ago now. Uh, long. Wow. Yeah, we've we've had. Around 25 people or so in so far. Um, it was uh, previous only for LS7s and LS9s, I believe, for 2013. It's going to be opened up for LS3s, so that'll be a good little perk for uh, 2013. Um, but very unique experience. Um, no complaints on any of the customers so far. They absolutely love the experience. 
Um, what do you mean the experience? Explain that part. Well, it this is, is kind of cool. It is a total experience. Uh, the night before their build, they'll usually come in and they they have a uh, dinner with some of the some people within GM, whether it's like part of the vehicle line team, maybe somebody from our plant. Uh, depends on who's available. Um, but they come in the day before, have dinner with them, and then they uh, get transported to our plant early in the morning to start about 6:30 in the morning. Brief introduction of the whole process, and then we get them with their skilled engine builder to go out and start building their monster engine. But now they've got to pay for this privilege, do they not? It is an option. You check off at the dealership. Uh, it's it's like $5,800. Okay, almost six grand. That's what yep. I remembered it as. How many people take advantage of doing that? Is every single one of your engines built with a, a customer? Uh, no. Like I said, it's been about 25 people so far. Um, okay. We, had, we did have a repeat customer, so... <laughs> Has the, that been uh, spread out throughout the year, or, or did you just get a lot of people when you first announced it? Uh, off? You know, it's it's spread here and there. One, at one point, we had several uh, several in one month. Um, you know, I, I don't know what the future of it is, but it seems to be pretty steady, though. It doesn't, uh, you know, one every two weeks or three weeks. How long we didn't want it to be too too widespread, um, but we, we wanted to be unique and special for, for the customers that, that elect to do it too. How long does it take them to do it? It takes them pretty much the full day. We work uh, 10 hour days in Wick Summit. It takes them a good eight or nine hours. And if one of your experts is alone, how long does it take it, him to do it? Not that long. He'll build three engines a day if, uh, if he's left alone. So that's part of the cost. Syncing it up in Bowling Green is part of the cost, you know. Uh, you get a lot of stuff to take away from the experience. There's a there's a cameraman that follows you throughout the day. You get some uh, some articles that you that start conversations. You know, with the, and of course it's a total conversation starter at any Saturday night car show or whatever. So be able to say you built your own engine in your Corvette. But you'd never let them build it on the on their own, would no. you? <laughs> Not on their total loan, no. I wouldn't um, do that only if I was building it for someone else's car. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now this is just assembly, right? You guys aren't machining heads just with assembly. locks or anything just like assembly. that, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Why did GM decide to do this? Uh, we wanted to get a closer the customer to get an even closer appreciation to their. I mean, Corvette always has a lot of. Uh, outlets for the, the customers to be able to come closer to their cars with museum delivery. They can walk and watch their car around the assembly line down in Bowling Green. And uh, this is just a further extension of that whole Corvette ownership experience. That really, they can walk the line as their cars be getting yeah. built at Bowling Green? I didn't know that. It's part of the Corvette buyer's package, I believe. That's pretty cool. I, I, I would do that if I was buying a VAT. I'd love to do sure. that. In fact, I'd like to push those guys aside and do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we've added that option yet, but now you're onto something. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, only for someone else's car. <laughs> hey, you know, the, uh, I'd even join the union to be able to do that. So, I mean, even the UAW could get behind us. <laughs> so how'd you get into this? I mean, what's your background and how did you end up at this place? Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer. I started my career with uh, GM in Livonia, building uh, North Star Cadillac engines there. And uh, I'm a gearhead and total Corvette uh, lover myself, so my plant manager at the time got me over to Wixom where, where we build the ultimate Corvette engine. So been there about three years now, love it, can't complain at all. Do you know where, I mean, the Corvette Racing used to have their motors built in, uh, at K-Tech, and then didn't they come to Wixom for a while, and are they out somewhere else now being assembled, or do you know? Um, or don't you want to comment on that? Yeah, I don't, I don't know okay. if I want to comment that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, that's fair game. If you don't want to say something, you just say, ah, that. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so are you guys out looking to try to get more engines in the place? Are you maxed out now, or how's it all uh, we're, we're always looking for more. I mean, uh, seeing, seeing what's, what's out there, but uh, we're, we're not maxed out. We're running one shift. Um, Beauty of our operation is we just add people to make more or, you know, we, we've always worked on our processes, but more people, more engines. It's a because you guys have one assembler per engine, right? It's one not a team, it's one guy does the whole thing. The entire engine. From I say, guys, you got any gals in there too? Not currently, but we have in the past. Uh -huh. um, but, but one skilled engine builder builds the entire engine from start to finish. 
and he just uh, pushes it on a rack right down to the next station. He pushes it on a very sturdy engine cart that uh, you, we'd all like to have in our garages, but uh, passes it from station to station and does whatever work he needs to accomplish in that station with all the tools lined up, organized in an orderly fashion so that he can accomplish whatever tasks he needs to and moves on to the next station. Does he sign the engine like they do at AMG? We have nameplates that each builder affixes to the engine towards the end of the build process, yes. And everything's documented with his, his name, serial numbers, everything like that. So you start with a bare block? Start with a bare block. Actually, the first station is a piston breakdown where we go in and check the pistons over, make sure we put the bearings in, and uh, then we start, start with the block. Do you guys uh, fit pistons to specific bores? No. Uh, Just one piston fits all. Yeah, huh? tolerances are. Because I remember so in the old days that, when I'd go through engine plants, there would be at least three different piston sizes for any given engine. And they would just check and see how the bores got machined out and find pistons that fit the best. Yeah. But I guess machining's a whole lot better than when I was. <laughs> yeah, I hope so, yeah. <laughs> I was actually uh, very small microns. <laughs> <laughs> my my colleague Frank Marcus actually did a, a video uh, building an engine in your plant, and I was kind of his assistant. I think I wore a lab coat or something. But, <laughs> and tried not to drop parts. That was that was my role. Yeah, those aren't parts you want to drop. <laughs> I, know. I know. So the so the V8 engine, I, I, I contend, is becoming more and more of a specialty engine. That, that is. V8s now are, will soon become what V12s have been. Uh, that is, you know, uh, because you're getting better power out of uh, smaller engines and because of CAFE and so on, mainstream cars that used to have V6s now have 4s. A lot of cars, you know, we're, we're going to see even cars like uh, Mercedes S-Class size cars that have been sold with six-cylinder engines in Europe will, will be coming here before too long. Do you think... Uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, you can't wait to build more of a little 1.4 little uh, e liter no, but I mean, Ecotex, right? No, the point is that, that, that the V8 will become even more of a spe Not that they're not going to keep building them. Obviously, you can yeah. keep doing that, and you're getting better fuel efficiency out of them as well. But really, you know, more uh, a smaller volume sort of engine, um, you know, probably a higher price to the, to the buyer, uh, more specialized cars, Corvettes and Cadillacs, basically, right? Uh, I, I don't know what the future future may hold, and it's probably not my my arena to comment on that. But uh, I I hope not for for my sake, because I'm a I'm a gearhead, so I'm gonna like the V8 power. But um, you know, uh, whatever the future holds, well, I'm, I'm sure we'll make improvements and and continue to up the envelope so that so that it blends V6s into V8s and <laughs> V8s into who knows what, so. Well, I've always said that when they really do release the UFO that they've got in Boswell, that we're going to find when they do their reverse engineering of it and dig down into that thing, there's going to be a small block V8 in it, <laughs> I swear to God. And it, it might right. run on dilithium crystals, but it's going to be a V8. It's going to be a small block. Mm, I like that thinking. <laughs> Hey, uh, you know, it's uh, time that we get into rapid fire, but before we do that, we really have got to take uh, another break here. And uh, Ben, uh, why don't we give a, a shout out to our friends at Chevrolet? It was more than a car to him. It really was his baby. Oh no, that's my old Chevy. Dear God. Okay, and now it's time for a rapid fire where we get into all the questions for, from the audience. And Ben, let's, let's crank her up. Okay, uh, Mitch W. says, would Rob explain the Nordschleife shirt, please? Nurburgring? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a shirt that uh, it's... it's the time the, the last ZR1 ran on the Nürburgring run uh, with the new Pilot Sport Cup tires on it. So what's that? That's an outline of the track yeah. and yep. what, the, the time that it's turned? 719.6. Yeah. <laughs> Anywhere out there for that? Were you out there for that? I, I wish, but no, I can't. I he, can't uh, he just has the yep. t-shirt, Todd. We just built the engine in the, uh, in the car. That's uh, uh, any enthusiast 
should make a pilgrimage to the Norwich Life at once. It's spectacular. I've only seen it. I've not driven it. Uh, it's but, just yeah. amazing. That'd be nice to drive it. Yeah. Uh, VRM, Chris, maybe this isn't for you, but Todd or Peter can chime in. Will there be performance four-cylinder engines offered to the public in the near future? Well, there already they're, are. There already I mean, are. What do you consider performance? Mm -hmm. uh, a Volkswagen two-liter uh, two-liter turbo in something like the GTI, nice engine. In fact, it's amazing some of the power density that they're getting. Well, look at the, the Regal GS turbo. Oh yeah, yeah. another good example. Horse. 270 horsepower. 270 horsepower, you know, and I had one. That thing screams. Yeah, yeah, they're definitely high performance four cylinders. Sure. Goggles Passano has a great comment on my uh, Prius here with the uh, leaking coolant. He says instead of the Prius, you accidentally brought in the Yes. <laughs> hey, we got some phone calls coming in. Ben, let's bring in the first one. Hi, guys. This is Mike from Vermont. And uh, since you do a lot of first drives, I was wondering if you could give us some advice for what to do during a test drive. We get maybe 30 minutes with the car. Certainly, we can do all the uh, visual inspections. But what should we do legally on a test drive? and uh, we've got a salesman with us, but we want to get a sense for how this car will drive. Thanks so much. And good question. Good here's, here's the sum. Go take it home to your significant other. If she doesn't say, oh, that's cute, then maybe you have a shot. <laughs> if she says it's cute, return it immediately to the dealer. Yeah, if you could possibly take it out on your own for any period of time, uh, obviously the first thing you want to do is find a rough road, which the salesman is going to try to avoid. Yeah. And um, if you find it, if you have a twisty road nearby, that's the next thing. But that's always kind of a tough thing to do. Well, m my advice is go take it on roads that you're familiar with. Because when you're driving in new areas, you know, you drive 20 miles or whatever it happens to be over to find the best deal at a dealership. Now you're driving around. You're looking at the new surroundings that you're in. You're not paying as well attention as to taking it on roads that you do every day. And not just this road or that road. Take it on the freeway. Take it on, you know, suburban roads. Take it into parking lots. How maneuverable is it? Yeah. Take that significant other with you. Does he or she like it? Do the kids like it? Can they get in and out? Can grandma get in and out of the thing? I mean, use it like you'd normally use it. And if the salesman bitches, tell them to shut up. And you got to evaluate it. Try to go to one of those big sales parks where you can try several different models on the same road so that you're you're replicating the roads, same speeds and everything. And the different model thing is, uh, is a good example because as we've talked about on the show before, you know, I drove uh, the Chevy Sonic, and I thought, yeah, this is a, a, a decent, capable car, but so what? And then I drove the 1.4 Turbo six-speed manual, Which and I went, a... damn, is this a good car. Yeah. So, yeah, try out different variations. And also remember, you're buying a dealership almost as much as you're buying a car. Who treats you well? You know, somebody might treat you like royalty, and maybe the car is not exactly what you wanted, but... Somebody else might sell you the car of your dreams and treat you like dirt. Yeah. Don't don't pick the don't necessarily buy the car from the place that you test drove it. I mean, once you figured out what you want, go to a bunch of different dealers and get the best deal. Here's the key. Like what you buy. Yes. If you like it, buy it and enjoy it and and go by your gut feel. Yeah, I mean, you can study this thing till yeah. the end of the world, I mean, but go with your gut. A, not, you can be on the internet and compare if you like the way it drives and you like it, buy it. Right. And you don't need to spend luxury car money to get, get a really good car. Right. So right. There's something you really like. But I will highly recommend any auto enthusiast to go to the Bentley Motors website and conf play with the configurator. The best in the business. It's just um, awesome. <laughs> okay, let's see. George from Brooklyn says, are Corvette owners allowed to do some spot welding as well? No, uh, sure not. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I am sure not. Uh, DC Auto Geek wants to know, are Corvette owners allowed to bring their own seat to install? No. No. Okay. You've got to make it clear. We're talking just about the engine, not the entire car. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, you mentioned the plant. Yeah. Jeff W. says, jumping topics here, why is Sergio so hell-bent on making Alfa Romeo a global brand? And if you were Sergio, would you do the same? I know the brand has a great history, but I almost see this as a distraction to Fiat reaching the six million unit volume it says it must reach. Well, Sergio's all in on, on his idea to do that, but you know, Alfa is a great brand, but it's almost insignificant now, even in Italy. And taking it globally is just like, 
I, you know, I don't see it. I mean, it's going to require so much money and it's going to be a 10 year deal. And Sergio's looking at his watch promising his dealers like in 2014, it's going to all be good. It doesn't work that way. The good news is that he, um, that, that, that he can use platforms developed with Chrysler to get it back to being a rear drive brand. The bad news is that he thinks that the next step there is that he can go up against BMW with it, and that's deadly. Well, I would take it global. I, I'd pour a lot into it. That brand has never reached its potential, never come close. Well, they lose money on it. I, I would uh, make that priority number one. Well, Get yeah, that thing on its feet. They do have a beautiful design aesthetic. I mean, going oh, through the years, there's some, been some bad alphas, but there have been some really gorgeous ones too. I just did my column on, on branding this week. And mm. uh, you know, I hear you about Alpha. You know, I like Alphas. I like what they represented. I think now they're kind of vague, you know. We don't, we see them occasionally here. But it's gonna take a long, long time. And get started now. Well, I agree with you, it's gonna take a long time and a lot of money, I, but, but better get started. But the disconnect is Sergio saying 2014 to his dealers, and come on. Right. And it started in 2006, that was the first year they were supposed to come here. Yeah. Um, I would say don't worry so much about when are you gonna bring Alpha to the U.S. I'd say, you know, fi you're right, yeah. fix the don't cars first. Don't announce years. Yeah. Uh, the fact that they're, you know, we hear they're working on a smaller rear drive platform that would serve uh, for a, uh, a modern Plymouth Barracuda style car to replace the Challenger, and then uh, they could use that smaller rear drive platform to uh, underpin some um, some nice alphas. Uh, well, there's all kinds of things. Years, yeah, the there's all kinds of things I can do. I just, you know, if I was advising Sergio personally, I would say, Sergio, just do it. Don't talk about it and right, don't right. over promise right. because inevitably you're going to under deliver. Now, you've already under delivered badly on fiat. To me, I would say, boy, I'm, I'm, I'm just not going to talk about Alpha. We're just going to show yeah. everybody. Well, you're talking under-delivered on fiat in the American market. Yeah. Yeah. Because he actually did a pretty good job of turning that place around in Europe, although he's going to have to do it all over. Well, as again. I said, he, if he reduced the espresso machines by 40%, he would have looked like a hero at fiat <laughs> in Europe. So You can't run an Italian car company without the, the espresso. Have well, it. I know, but even if he reduced them, he would have looked like a hero. Cause yeah. Let's get all the money we just saved. Yeah. Okay, we got another phoner, Ben. Bring it in. John, this is Dave Britton from Fort Wayne, Indiana. Just wondering uh, what's going on with why we can't get diesel uh, automobiles over here in the U.S. Uh, when they have them so many in Europe. And... Uh, why is diesel fuel so expensive? Because uh, I know I have a diesel truck, and, and diesel fuel used to be 20 cents a gallon cheaper than regular, and now it's uh, like 50 cents a gallon more. So if you could, let me know that, please. That that's a whole nother show. That is a whole show. We should put a coffee can on the table here and throw a buck in every time somebody <laughs> asks us that question because, man, we've answered it a million times. Yeah, you remember when diesel became as expensive as gasoline was when, you know, Oldsmobile started selling diesels, when, when car buyers started trying to drive diesels. Just here's the thumbnail. You're going to see a lot more diesels. Diesels currently outsell hybrids in the American market. Diesel sales will double by around 2015. GM's coming out with it, Mazda's coming out with it, Chrysler's coming out with it. You're gonna see a whole lot more diesels in the US. Why is diesel fuel higher, to Todd's point? We have limited refining capacity. All those heavy duty pickups out now, full size you know, uh, pickups with diesels, they've really boosted up diesel demand and uh, it's supply and demand. And then going to a low sulf, uh, ultra low that, that, sulfur. That helped raise the diesel. price too, but the, the big thing is we just don't have nearly as much diesel refining capacity in the U.S. as we have gasoline. I'd love to see it double, but I, I think it's going to be a hard sell for a few years. In, in the I, I, we, we'll, we'll make a bet and throw some more money into that coffee okay. can then. All right. Okay, there's a, a Todd Lassa question here. Where did I see that? From Danny Boy in Cleveland, Ohio says, first to Mr. Lassa, congrats on Motor Trend Magazine, on what Motor Trend Magazine is becoming. At one point in time, Motor Trend used to be on the bottom of my most popular magazine pile. Now it is on the very top, exclamation point, he added. Thanks. Great job, keep up the good work. Uh, 
<laughs> this oh, ties in beautifully. Fun, right? there's, there's no, 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 no. Secondly, a question for Mr. Mickles. Nichols, might we see a high-performance diesel sports car in GM's future? Uh, that's out of my realm of... Yeah, uh, he's not going to comment yeah. on that. What do you think, Peter? Well, before the bankruptcy, GM did that brilliant big block... V6 diesel. Diesel that... Was a 3... I shouldn't say, what was that? 46 diesel, wasn't it? Yeah, but everyone in the business said it was the absolute state, the most brilliant diesel they'd ever seen, and they put it on the shelf. Right. So I got to believe, you know, that's going to be dusted off eventually. For cafe reasons, if nothing else. Yeah, that had the exhaust coming out of the V yeah. of the engine. And That's the what was so intriguing because oh, right. they could package the turbo very well. I mean, that, that won all kinds of awards and patents. Yeah. Were, I mean, it was. Yeah, but they need they need fours and maybe sixes before. Well, yeah, of course. Here and and again, I think it's going to be a. But I would, you know, but it was I, a six, I wish, wasn't it? Was it a six? Oh, it was a six. I okay. think it was a six diesel. I mean, BMW yeah. just announced a diesel uh, version of a six series, high Yowza. performance version diesel. Yeah. So yeah, if BMW can do M diesels. And Audi, of course, is race diesel. Right. And, and Peugeot. And Peugeot. And Peugeot. That, that new division of Peugeot. General Motors, right? I think, <laughs> I think we may see a high performance V6 in the C8 Corvette. Not the C7, but the C8. Hmm. Interesting. As, a, as the entry level motor, and then you go up to the V8. Okay, we got uh, another uh, phoner here. Ben, let's bring it in. Yes, uh, my name is Clem Zorowski, Delmont, Pennsylvania. Uh, are you people building the Corvette race team engines? And if you are, are they direct injection for uh, 2012? Uh, thank you very much. Well, we already answered that. It, it, no. well, yeah, we're not, building, we're not building them in the PBC side. What about direct injection? Do you know if they're using that I in racing? Hmm. Okay, let's see. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Uh, George from Brooklyn wants to know, question for all on the show. If you could come up with a tagline for a Mazda campaign, what would it be? Zoom, zoom. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, worked, I love the new campaign they have right now with I'm a Roadrunner, baby, the music. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's really well done. Mm -hmm. But yeah, speaking from an ad, ad guy's perspective, but again, it's, you know, Mazda's like, kind of out there but not really registering with people. Right. You know, I think the, and, and full disclosure, uh, we have a Miata, my wife drives it mostly, um, but she really likes the commercial, the, the kind of uh, brand-wide commercial where they show lots of people having fun in different kinds of Mazda. Well, I think that's what Peter's talking about. Oh, that's the one. Yeah. So that's not the, okay, Roadrunner I, Baby? The, well, the Roadrunner, the, the song. The soundtrack. Road to the, the, the ad. Roadrunner Baby. Right. Okay. I think really, that's the ad you're talking about. Uh, maybe Todd. it is. I'm I think sorry. so. And thinking but you're right, your wife is right. That is a good ad. Yeah, it is. <laughs> okay, Mike D. White says, why not a Tesla Fisker merger? It would keep... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I think you got your answer, Mike. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> it would keep both companies alive longer and combine the best EV know-how outside the big players. Well, you know the, the big news this week was the, the bricking of the Teslas. Yes. They're left unattended. They, the battery just, it's gone. and It, it goes crap hole. And it's 40 grand to fix. And well, that, that, that was what somebody's alleging. So uh, what others are saying is, yeah, how come we haven't heard of this before if this is a common problem or I common I don't know problem. if it's common. It's just the fact it, that it's, it's happening. Happened. But I would say this, you know, Fisker, he's got a hybrid. I don't know is that he's bringing anything new to the party. Uh, I will give Tesla credit that they've got the software that manages all the different battery cells and everything. So they're bringing something new to the party that that they are contributing. Fisker's just buying stuff off the shelf and styling around it. So I, I don't see Well, and, so and I, you know, Fisker is vaporware. I mean, yeah. you yeah. know, he, he has no money. He, he, he got uh, one of his federal loans fell through. Um, you know, he's supposed to be building cars in, in Delaware in an old GM yeah, plant. Yeah. Yeah. We said that when it first was announced. Okay. That ain't gonna I mean, happen. you know, he's been allowed to indulge his design fantasies. He's got a huge ego. Fisker's a nice looking car, but it weighs 50, almost yeah, 6,000 5, pounds, whatever. Yeah. It's just it, ridiculous. It was a science experiment when we had it on Car of the Year. Was, <laughs> we, we, were, we were the uh, test engineers for that car. Really? Oh, it's not it's, that well developed. Not very well developed. You know, I mean, when 
are, P, are, are these guys with big egos going to learn that, you know, it didn't work for Tucker, it's not going to work for you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but General Motors bought out <laughs> they, Tucker. They bought He's out the one who done it. Yep. Come on, Todd. It was a conspiracy against Tucker. <laughs> right. It killed him. Yeah. Hey, we got more phoners coming in. Ben, let's bring one in. Hey, John, and uh, the auto extremists and guests. Um, I have a question. Um, love the show from Burlington, uh, North Carolina, and um, just wondering if you think that uh, GM is going to answer with uh, Ford throwing down the gauntlet that they've got the most powerful V8 uh, in 2013, if you think that uh, uh, GM's going to answer the call with my guess is a more powerful LS9. Just love to hear y'all's thought. Take care. Bye. That's a great question. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask that and I forgot. <laughs> uh, 650 horsepower. I don't know. I guess time will tell. Oh, that's. Oh, he bad. said that with a big <laughs> smile on his face, folks. <laughs> is there still room in the, the horsepower wars? I don't think the horsepower wars will ever stop. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's the answer we wanted. So you think that they should? Well, I, you know, I mean, it's it's um, it's bragging rights. It's uh, you know, you they've got what twelve horsepower more than the uh, ZL1 engine, and you know, it, it it's you, you wonder how much. How long can it escalate? Can it get up to, you know, 675 and <laughs> why not? 700? Well, well, yeah, why not? exactly, exactly. I mean, because why a few not? years ago, we would have said, oh, you're never going to see a Mustang with 650 horsepower. Well, That'll that never happen in our lives. Well, the ZL1 is 580, and the yeah. Mustang is I meant to say ZR1 is uh, 6, 638, right? 638. So we know what, what they can get out of an engine like that. And that's yeah. what they're admitting to what it is, right? Well... We ought to throw some of these things on a dyno and see what the real numbers are. Uh, <laughs> sounds like a motor trend story. We ought to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I think... All I know is there's nothing like the sound of those kind of motors. There just isn't. No, there isn't. And, and that's, that's right. why I'd, uh, I'd hate to see it go because I keep arguing, look, power to weight is the real argument. We shouldn't be arguing horsepower or torque. Yeah. It's, it's really power to weight. And that's where it comes down to. So... I still love, uh, sorry to bring it up, Todd, but years ago, Motor tr or, uh, Road and Track did a great story p pitting all these supercars on a track versus a Caterham that had like this 125 horsepower Ford Crossflow 1.6 or something. Mm -hmm. that it, it beat the pants off everything because it was just so lightweight. You can you know? mention Road and Track. Matt got me into this side of the business, so I'm fine with that. <laughs> yeah, all you do is drive, you take the catarum and keep your right foot planted. You don't even need a lift, right? That's yeah. right. That's exactly right. Well, let's see here. Uh, looks like we have another phone call, I think. Do we? Am I reading that right? No phone call. No phone call. Okay. Uh, Mr. W72 wants to know, Rob, have you ever got a letter or email to a to the specific engine builder on how great it was on the track or how he lost his pink slip? <laughs> <laughs> well, customer interaction is one of the big things we do do at our plant. We, uh, we do get a lot of emails and, and letters from customers, and uh, we actually send out posters signed by our builders to customers if they give us their address. Um, we're constantly on forums and talking with the customers. Uh, we give a lot of tours in our plants uh, to owners or enthusiasts alike. So we like to, to share what we do in our plant because we're proud of it. Do you have someone dedicated in your plant to returning calls and that sort of thing? I know that I'm, Mark Royce, for example, was making calls, and, but that was corporation-wide. I'm kind of the contact. There's, we also have a PBC website where there's an uh, online form to fill out for, for tours and visits. Um, there you go. So There's, call Rob. Is, yeah, is the answer. Okay. but but it is the, you Google PB, Wixom PBC and you'll you'll find our website and there's all kinds of links on there to be able to figure out where to go and what to do and when we can we can have you in. Chuck Grunchy wants to know: Before the bankruptcy, there was major talk of new V8s and GM's development cycle. Were these new engines canned or just delayed? New V8s, huh? Uh, well, there was the uh, there was the yeah there was, there was the replacement for the North Star that uh, was going to go into among other vehicles uh, the, the Buick Enclave. Um, you know, I think again this kind of gets back to um, what I said. I 
let me make it clear. I'm not saying V8s are going to go away, but it'll be more of a specialty kind of engine, I think. And if you can get more horsepower, more torque out of a V6, uh, and because of the CAFE regulations you've got coming up, uh, I think you're going to see that. In, in the mainstream models, uh, you'll see a downsizing. You're already seeing a downsizing. That Chevy Malibu, the new one, there's no V6 option for that. Same with many of its competitors, including the, the new Ford Fusion. So, you know, that, yeah, there was that V8 uh, that, that was canned, uh, I think, in late 07, early 08, perhaps. Hmm. I mean, V8s will be there. They'll just be costly when you want Yeah, them. right. Yep. It'll be for luxury cars and sports cars. Yeah. Catalan Alexei from Romania has uh, written in to us. He says, why doesn't Chevy use the WTCC wins in their marketing? World Touring Car Championship, yes. right? He's from Romania where Romania, you know Romania. all about that. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, yeah. Nobody knows about that. No, nobody in America knows what WTCC is. That's, that's a question but for Joel Awanek. That's for Joel Awanek, but very interesting because clearly if uh, Catalan's asking us this, over in Europe, he's not seeing them advertise their wins. That's so what. why get in the racing if you're not going to brag about you winning? Yeah. Well, this is from a part of the world where football means you, you kick a round ball. Yeah, that's okay? <laughs> So it's, it's the same thing. There's no interest here. Okay, uh, Jay Cujo says, uh, question for our Chevy guest. As the new owner of a Chevy Cruze, I want to know why I cannot get the same kind of performance accessories like you could on the Cobalt SS. I know GM is trying to save costs, but with Ford doing the Focus ST and Dodge having all so sorts of Mopar stuff for the Dart, where's the general? Well, I think there, there's going to be a bunch of stuff for the Cruise, but um, I think GM is focusing on the Sonic first. And they've made it clear that, Chevy has made it clear that it won't do an SS, uh, badge anything in SS unless it's got the engine and the chassis for it. And right. I don't think you're going to see that in a car like the Cruise. You might see, you'd probably see it in the Malibu, the new one, before you'd see it in the cruise. See, Rob, these guys are saving your ass. You don't have to answer these questions. Yeah. We're talking then about you go back to work the next day and they go, what the hell were you saying all that stuff for? We're talking about four-cylinder cars. Rob yeah. doesn't care about four-cylinder cars. Right. Even if it's we need, Give me four more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you'd say, where's the other half Let's of the block? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's really, that's really a question for our marketing <laughs> guys. Four-cylinders are starter motors for those big blocks. <laughs> <laughs> that's about true, too. Jeez. Okay, Peter, here's one for you. Brian wants to know, there were leaked patent images this week of a four-door Mercedes SLS AMG. I don't know if you saw those. Autoblog had some stuff on it. Anyway, he says, isn't this what Peter often describes as an answer to a question nobody asked? Yeah, pretty much. But you're, you're seeing that. I mean, Mercedes is going to answer the BMW X6. You know, people don't think the X6 is very successful, but it happens to have been fairly successful for BMW um, all over the globe. So now Mercedes is answering that. And well, the Germans live in their own world, you know. <laughs> but they do, you know. I mean, BMW, Mercedes, Audi, it's just like the Bermuda Triangle. They just, ha they cannot stand being outdone by each other. Oh, yeah, That's yeah. Right. They, <laughs> Which I mean, is good. I mean, it's good, yeah. No, I mean, I like it. Yeah, I do too. There's stories of, you know, companies like BMW doing a concept uh, just to get Mercedes to actually build a car like yeah. it, you know. And, oh, we were never going to build that, you know. Right. <laughs> so, furniture one more yeah, time. yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. They ran the, the qualifiers today at Daytona, right? Yes. Um, I predicting the 500's nuts. Any number, 20 people could do it. Right. Danica actually did pretty well today, but got taken out in the last lap and had a big impact. She was okay. Huh. But uh, at heavy, that huh? part of the track, they didn't used to have safer barriers. Hmm. Let me just say, if there weren't safer barriers there, I think she would have been seriously hurt. It wow. was a huge impact. Wow. She was lucky. So I, no predictions from you? For free. Okay. Well, you know, I, <laughs> Hendrick, uh, Roush, I mean, that's, that's you know, it's going to be a shootout, basically. Yeah. And then Kyle Busch, you know. Yeah. Can't count him out, but... And but like you, know, you say, 20 people could win. Yeah, 20. Easy. 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 In fact, maybe 21, because last year, Car 21 won, and nobody would have picked Trevor Bain to win the thing in a million years. Yeah. So there you go. But the cars are running super hot, 
you know, they've reduced the cooling capacity because they want them to not do the two car tandem drafting. Mm -hmm. So you have to step out and cool your motors, but they were running way hot today. And NASCAR allowed them more, more uh, I don't know if it's more capacity on the, on the radiators, but something that allows them a little more extra uh, margin for error. But I think there's going to be issues Sunday with engines mm. going. So. Zowie. Well, hey, we ought to wrap it up here. With the furniture? Well, let me give another plug to Office Furniture Solutions, our buddy Nate Anderson, who arranged all this. Thanks, Nate. We, lo we love it. We do. Hey, we're comfy. Check it out at OFSonline.com or give Nate a call, 248-668-0077. And mention AutoLine after hours. <laughs> right. Peter, great having you. Todd, excellent having you back here, but thank Rob you. Nichols, especially. Uh, thank Thanks for coming yeah, on, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, one of these days I'm gonna have to go build me an engine. Hey, there. you're so, welcome. <laughs> that's cool. Come on over. That's great. Well, thanks folks for having tuned in. Great show, glad you were with us. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion, and by Chevrolet, Chevy runs deep. And for all of you still watching here, you know, before we go, remember you can get the iPod or, or <laughs> you can get the podcast at the iTunes store tomorrow. It's free. Just look for our uh, out of line after hours and tell your friends, especially those who travel. It's uh, listening to our podcast is a great way to kill a plane ride. And Facebook, go to facebook.com slash out Detroit, twitter.com slash out go to auto extremist.com. Or twitter.com slash auto extremists and what? Motortrend.com? Motortrend.com and I uh, tweet Twitter, what do you call it? At yeah. M MT under slash L A S S A at uh, Twitter. MT under slash L A S S A. L A S S A. Trend Todd, I guess. And does the Wixom Performance Build Center have a website? We have a website. Uh, Google PBC Wixom, it'll okay. pop up. Uh, I think it's under. GMPowertrain.com or something like that, but uh, cool. it'll pop up. Good. And We're done. And good night, Simon, wherever you are. <laughs> cool. Well, this was great. Uh, good having you on. Appreciate it. Yeah. This is uh, very relaxed. Good stuff. Yeah. 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 I told you, it's a, it's a great format. Just like being on radio. Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I did some stuff out at SEMA while I was out there, and that was kind of an introduction. They had a camera crew and they were videoing us as we were doing a little tear down and build up of our LS9 and uh -huh. that was pretty interesting.